Let's go live on Facebook. Nice to see you all in here. And we'll see you soon. Here we go. We are live. I believe. I think I think it is. Uh, welcome everybody. This is a uh, welcome to this Augusta Heritage Center cultural session. This is a, the last one in our fall series of cultural sessions, but fear not, we have a robust series of winter cultural sessions that will be uh, continuing uh, from January on up into the um, end of March. Uh, the next one we have is on uh, January the 5th, and that one is, uh, let's see here. I had it just you know. Oh, it's the passing it on the family musical traditions. That's going to be really, really cool. Um, it, it's with um, Trisha Spencer and Howard Rains. They were uh, supposed to join us for October Old Time Week this year, and of course, uh, our plans got waylaid by the current situation the world's in. But we're very happy to continue to bring this content to everybody via digital means. And they're going to talk about how they have learned. A uh, certain uh, repertoire and the old time genre from from their families and how old time music gets passed down from generation to generation. And our guest tonight may have a couple things to say about that as well. Um, these sessions are generously brought to, to you uh, with support from the National Endowment from the Arts uh, for the Arts, the West Virginia Department of Arts, Culture, and History. And in particular, this one, the West Virginia Humanities Council, which has a direct hand in us being able to bring this cultural content to you virtually uh, during this difficult time. Uh, we also uh, thank our host, uh, Dave Snelkis College, for their support. And we're looking forward to seeing each and every one of you as soon as we can gather again. Um, we do have programming continuing through this winter. We've put together something called the Augusta Winter Sessions. This has 25 uh, traditional master artists of various genres, including blues, gospel, old time, uh, bluegrass, uh, local music, and uh, country music. And these uh, instructors have each pre-recorded a series of lessons, and uh, it's a broad stretch of um, ability levels everywhere, everything from I've never touched this instrument before, and I want to start uh, from completely from scratch up to somebody that's a lifelong learner of music and has been jamming for many, many years. So each each instructor will uh, kind of have a, a spectrum uh, of lessons. There's also sessions that are intended for members only. Uh, the first one is uh, our AmeriCorps, Hannah, has digitized, we were just talking about this, 200 tapes from the Augusta Archive. This is an immense project and we're just beginning. Her goal is to do a thousand tapes this year. So we're 200 in and she has uh, found some really, really just gems of tracks in there. And so we're gonna have an, uh, an Augusta Archives listening party coming up in early January as well. If you'd like to give the gift of an Augusta experience, you can also do that with the winter sessions. It's a really cool thing on the website where you can um, purchase a membership and then time when the recipient will receive that email along with a personalized message. And we won't spoil the surprise before that person gets it. Um, so if you're into giving experiential gifts this year, it's a, it's a good one to give for the person that has everything. We'd also like to thank our donors. Uh, this year has just been an incredible outpouring of support. Um, uh, folks that are, Augusta is near and dear to their heart, uh, have really kept the wheels on the bus during this difficult time. It began last spring and uh, we, we, your support has helped us with these continuous operations and has ensured that Augusta is going to return bigger and better than ever as soon as we can return to in-person programming. Now, that's not to say that the work is done. This giving season if you do choose to give, we, we would uh, encourage you to consider the Augusta Heritage Center because we're going to give that right back to you in spades. With cultural programming and educational programming that we try to make as free or low cost as possible. Um, some of that would be a, we've developed the high school jazz band curriculum 
that we're um, disseminating to high school students right now. We're in the process of taking everything that's been reported on the Augusta Heritage Center label, of which our guest has a ma been having major contributions, and we're beginning to put that material on our website or streaming services for free as well. And this season, if you can, I mean, everything matters. It does, I mean, every donation, every, every, everything does matter. We do have a special gift for those of you that can pledge $200 or more. Um, we have partnered with a West Virginia glass company called Appalachian Glass. They're over in Weston. They're the last standing um, glass manufacturer, a long tradition of glass manufacturers over there. And they have made these just absolutely beautiful West Virginia or Augusta glass bulbs. Um, these would be look wonderful on any holiday tree. Emily was telling me she has a couple on uh, her family's. Uh, I prefer to hang them in the window all year round because when the sun comes through the window and lights these things up, they're absolutely spectacular. So I'll put a link um, to those things in the chat a little bit later on, both to the Winter Sessions memberships, so only 150 bucks. That's about 50 bucks a month uh, to be a member for all those lessons and cultural content, and then our, our donation portal as as well. Um, well, I'm, I'm gonna pass it over to Emily here and uh, she does have, oh, one more thing before I do. We will put a link to the survey in the chat, both here on Zoom and over on Facebook. This is for the West Virginia Humanities Council. If you appreciate the content we've been able to bring you, uh, please fill out that survey. It really does help us when we're communicating what, uh, how broad of a reach our projects have. And uh, it is something that is taken under consideration when we're writing our grants for the Humanities Council to be able to bring more content like this. So it really helps us. And in turn, it helps the West Virginia Humanities Council when they're communicating to the National Humanities Council. So you're helping the whole state of West Virginia when you fill out one of those surveys. Now, I'll pass it over to the Augusta Artistic Director, Ms. Emily Miller, and I'm so happy to do so. And this session is gonna be wonderful uh, in part because of the presenter and in part because of the relationship that Emily and Jerry have. It's just going to be a family affair tonight, and I'm so looking forward to it. Yes, I'm so pleased uh, to introduce to you Jerry Milnes, who um, as Seth was, uh, was implying there, is um, he has done so much, including uh, to raise two wonderful children. Jesse and Lydia, and I'm married to Jesse, so Terry is in fact my father-in-law here. But um, with that aside, uh, Jerry has done so much in the state of Virginia. Um, he was the folk arts coordinator at Augusta for 25 years, and um, the Augusta collection that Seth was talking about um, is has so many of Jerry's um, recordings in there. He has interviews with um, uh, with all sorts of, of tradition bearers. He has uh, musical recordings and photographs and things. So uh, Jerry has done a lot of work um, preserving and celebrating the culture of West Virginia. He's a wonderful musician himself and a scholar who's written several books um, that have been published uh, by academic press, various academic presses. Um, including uh, Signs, Curves, and Victory, which uh, you can check out um, in the Augusta. You can also watch his documentary, a lot of his documentaries on the Augusta Heritage YouTube channel. Um, but in any case, we have asked him to come here tonight to talk about West Virginia mumming traditions and mumming traditions in general, because uh, this is the time of year um, starting, well, as Jerry will, will tell you more about this, but this is the a big rich time of year for these kinds of cultural traditions and Jerry has done some uh, research into them in this state and I am delighted to pass the baton over to Jerry. Okay, can you hear me? Okay, uh, well Emily uh, knows that uh, I had some experience talking with old people about some mumming traditions. And uh, mumming traditions run from the end of October 
everybody, uh, pretty much everybody's familiar with Halloween. But they start there and they run all the way through to the beginning of spring. And mumming is, uh, it comes from a Greek word that simply means mask. So all these traditions where people dress up in masquerade and uh, carry on in various ways um, are now seen as, as mumming traditions. It's not just, uh, I know a lot of people associate mumming with just that period of the year, which is around the, uh, the winter solstice, but uh, actually the traditions run all through that, that, that series of months. Um, and uh, going back into prehistory, they really all have to do with the weather. Um, ancient people had uh, an awful time with weather, especially in Northern Europe, where all the traditions uh, that we have here came from. Um, and so it was, uh, I'll get into this more maybe when I, when I talk about some of the individual traditions, but um, when I first started uh, getting interested in this, I met some old people in the county just to the east of the county that I'm in, Randolph, uh, in Pendleton County, who talked about doing bell sneaking. And bell sneaking is a mummy tradition whereby people dressed up in masquerade and uh, the period between uh, usually a week before Christmas up to Christmas, uh, they would go about uh, dressing up in, in all kinds of outrageous costumes uh, and going from farm to farm, house to house in this case. Uh, and the, the, the idea was uh, they would, people would try to guess who they were. These were rural communities where everybody knew everybody. So uh, they, would be, they would know these people with their masks off, but they wouldn't know them in mask parade. So that was a big part of the deal. They would be trying to guess who they were. And in fact, when when I was a kid, that was a big thing in Halloween. Everybody tried to guess who you were when you went to a house. You went inside. You didn't just stop at the door. And um, part of the deal was that you were allowed at that time of year to beg. In fact, when I was a kid at Halloween, we were called beggars, not trick-or-treaters. And we went begging. That was the terms that, that were used. And with all these Roman traditions, that it, that's one um, um, thing that happens. You can find that in virtually all of them, whereby sanctioned begging, community sanctioned begging, begging is OK on that time, that day. Uh, and that happens uh, with Halloween, and it happened with the, the bell snickling tradition. Now, bell snickling uh, comes from a German term that was originally Pels Nicholas. In other words, translated to a furry St. Nicholas. Pell meaning fur, Nicholas meaning St. Nicholas. So Pels Nicholas eventually got anglicized to Pell Snickling. And I, there's lots of variations. I knew one old man who uh, said, oh yeah, I used to go bell sniggling all the time. So when, when a word like that gets out in the, in the countryside and, and gets changed around, you get all sorts of pronunciations and versions. But the most common one in Pendleton County where I was, was uh, bell sniggling. Uh, but I remember I talked to an old woman in Hardy County, which is a little, County just to the north of Pendleton, and I asked her if she ever went bell snickering, and she said, "Oh yeah, we went Chris Kringling all the time." And so, that's the, well, that's another term I hadn't heard. And it turns out that Chris Kringle was uh, a German term. Originally, the German people were getting kind of antsy about uh, uh, this this mumming tradition being so secularized, so they decided to introduce the Christ kingdom, the Christ child. And the tradition was that the Christ child was the person who brought you gifts. 
And, uh, but that over time got changed from Christ child to Chris Kringle and he became a Santa Claus like figure. And then this figure, the same as the bell sinker, would go around uh, uh, through the countryside. And it was, uh, th there was a lot of uh, um, disorder connected to all these bell sinking traditions and all these mummy traditions. Uh, there's a lot of uh, 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 role reversal goes on, uh, especially with the Shanghai tradition. Now, one time I was uh, I was talking to uh, an old man in Pendleton County about bell sniffing, and he said that yeah we went bell sniffing, but we also did Shanghai, and that was the, the first time I heard uh, that term. And he was very clear about the fact that bell sniffing was done in masquerade at night on foot. He walked. They walked in gangs of, of mostly young people from farm to farm, and they would beg for treats, and they would have people try to guess who they were, and they would change their voices, and sometimes they'd swap costumes between houses, so that, especially after telephones in, in use, uh, so people couldn't call ahead and say, so-and-so looks like this or whatever. Uh, but this old man, his name is Robert Simmons. And I think I can get, get a picture of Robert Simmons up here. Um, and this is Robert. Um, he, he was quite an interesting fellow. He uh, uh, knew a lot about the old traditions. He was a uh, a woodworker. He made little things on a shaving horse. He was a, a farmer, full-time farmer all his life. Uh, there's lots of tapes of Robert in the Augusta collection. I did many, many hours of interviews with Robert. But he's the first one that told me about the Shanghai tradition. And uh, he explained to me that horses were a big part of the Shanghai tradition because it was always done on horseback. Uh, there was a man who did some research into Shanghai over in um, the valley, over in the, the Great Valley, or the valley as it's called here, the meaning of Shenandoah Valley. And uh, he found that over there, the tradition was always done on horseback. And someplace I saw one old photograph of uh, Shanghaiers on horseback. Uh, so that's always been a part of it for some reason. Um, the other thing, this man, uh, there was a there was a university professor in uh, over in the valley who uh, did some research into Shanghai, and this was uh, way back in the 1930s. He started doing this, and he uh, he said that uh, in the in the German communities they did bell snickering, and in the Scots Irish communities. They did Shanghai. And so I was always trying to figure out, uh, you know, where, what was the ethnic origins of Shanghai. Bell snickling was pretty clear. That was definitely a German thing. Uh, and, the, you know, the two main groups of settlers in this part of the world were the German people and Scots Irish people. Uh, right around here, almost in equal numbers with uh, maybe English people a little, a little less in numbers and various others, but they were the main groups. Um, so I, uh, in, in thinking about this Shanghai, and, and, and someone mentioned a while ago, what, where does this term come from, Shanghai? Um, it does not, um, it does not relate to the, the, the sailors, Shanghai sailors on ships, I think. Here in West Virginia, anyway, there's a uh, be hard to connect the two there. And uh, a city in China uh, doesn't seem to relate in any way. So I came up with a theory. Um, Shanghai could be uh, two Gaelic words. And if this is a Scots-Irish tradition, this, this is a possibility, I think, that uh, two Gaelic words would be Shan, which is old, and Ash which is face. 
the old face could be, and that's just a theory of mine, and I don't have any way to prove that, uh, but it's the only thing I can come up with as a term that would relate to the masquerade tradition that we call Shanghai. Um, there's, um, you know, with masquerade traditions around the world, every, every culture in the world has a masquerade tradition. And a lot of it has to do with ancestor masks, and with spirit masks, and things that uh, are old or have been so as a way to communicate with uh, with those entities. So, you know, that's if old face uh, uh, connects to, the, to those two Gaelic words, that's about the only theory that I have, and it's certainly unproven. Um, but there's lots, there's also in the Shanghai tradition, the old way that Robert here uh, talked about, uh, there was also the begging for food. Uh, there would be asked for treats and they would be served usually in Pendleton County, it was cider and cake, and that usually meant hard cider. And there's a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, rowdiness goes on. These groups that went from farm to farm uh, in masquerade, there was a lot of uh, hooping and hollering and carrying on. And the same thing happened with bell snake. Uh, the groups would be screaming eerily, eerily, making all kinds of strange sounds. And they would get in the house and they would Cause, sometimes they would cause trouble. An old woman told me that her father had to kick him out of the house one time because somebody set off a firecracker inside the house and he didn't like that. And so uh, there was a lot of a lot of that kind of rowdiness going on with all of the what's known as the Christmas revels or the, the, uh, the, the revelry that takes place sort of outside of the religious aspects of Christmas. Uh, there's an awful lot of, uh, of uh, you know, things going on, people having fun in various ways, and a lot of drinking going on, and so that's all part of it. Now, after I met Robert and, and, and collected from a few old people in Pendleton County what their accounts of what Shanghai was, I, somehow, I, I forget how I found out about this, but I heard about what's called the Shanghai Parade which takes place in Lewisburg, West Virginia. Now, um, the, with, with Mumming traditions, there's a whole, there's a whole series of, of uh, different stages. The, the earliest and oldest forms are the informal uh, the things that I've been describing, where just informally a group of people get together, dress up in ugly or old or whatever clothes, masquerade, go from house to house, and it's very informal. And then it, it starts getting um, more formalized as, as, you, as you go on, uh, especially through time. And this happens, um, I think probably the end result of what we think of as mummy today would be the mummers parade in Philadelphia, where it's a very structured, formalized way of, of celebrating uh, a form of mummy. Uh, and it's, you know, it's very organized compared to the, the, the early forms. And if you go all the way into the spring festivals, uh, uh, we know, you know, what, what happens with Mardi Gras. Uh, in the rural areas, it's pretty, pretty informal. It's people in masquerade on horseback, riding from farm to farm, begging for food. And then when you get to New Orleans, it's a very formal parade, although there's lots of revelry and lots of uh, uh, drinking and, and, and tomfoolery going on. Uh, but there's these various stages where it moves from a very formal event to a very formal. So I heard about this Shanghai parade that takes place uh, in Lewisburg, West Virginia every year. So I've been down there probably three or four times and. I filmed it and I, I photographed it. And so now I'll see if I can get, get the, um, Emily, you might have to help me here. Yeah, so X out of that, that window. 
and we'll go, it'll take you back up in the upper right, and it'll take you back to that folder on your desktop. Okay, so um, one thing that happens is role reversal with Shanghai, with Shanghai, and this is the Shanghai parade in, in, in Lewisburg, and every year some an old a man in a diaper walks down the street. Uh, I guess uh, simulating a baby. So, uh, or you, you, everyone has to admire the lady in like dead center in the frame with the blue coat and the red scarf. Her face is amazing. Yeah, but every year, every year I've been there, there's been a man in a diaper who walks down the street. And I guess that's that's part of it. Um, now, let's see, I guess I'll have to do it this way. Anyway. So here's a man in a wheelchair. Everybody is in some sort of costume um, and uh, walking down the street. There's a few hundred people in the parade and there's a few hundred people on the main street in Lewisburg who are watching all this take place. Uh, man in a wheelchair again. The arrows showed back up. You can use the arrows now. Oh. Um, 4-H clubs are involved like this. Well, the Lewisburg uh, characters put on whatever and uh, head out. I'm not seeing that arrow, I mean, but. It, it disappeared again. <laughs> These ladies uh, rigged up seats for their fake legs and uh, walked down the street with fake legs on. All kind of characters and costumes uh, head down the street. There's prizes for the best uh, costumes, I think. And all through the parade, there is lots of horses and horses dressed up in masquerade themselves and, and that kind of thing. Do you know how long this tradition has been going on, the parade? How? Um, I've traced it back to to 1930, but no, I've actually heard of a 19th late 19th century. It was going on then, so, and I don't know how long before that. There was a man in uh, Lewisburg. I found this account in 1930 where he tried to uh, determine the source of the parade, the meaning of Shanghai, and all that, and he came up with nothing. And I talked to lots of people on the street uh, and asked them, you know. Uh, what does this mean? What is Shanghai? And nobody has a clue. All they know is they do it every year. And that's the thing about a lot of mumming practices. You know, they're kind of uh, kind of uh, hidden in some deep psychological uh, place, I guess. Uh, but they they are ritual events. Uh, I wonder what's going to happen this year. I don't know. But uh, these ritualized events for lots of the some lots of the same kind of activities show up. Jerry, in some like the the costume is meant to do something. And my, my mind goes right to Fosnacht, right, where you're trying to scare Old Man Winter away. In either um, Shanghai and or Belsnickling, have you found that the costume is supposed to have a purpose or is you know if I'm, I'm watching this parade it just seems like it's not quite halloween but it's definitely a choose your own adventure there's not like a, a really a, a theme here Did you find uh, yeah i think i think i think those things have probably uh if there was a theme it's it's gotten pretty widespread now and it's the same way with the mummers parade in philadelphia you know uh, there used to be a lot of blackface, and of course that's no longer exists there. But there's still a lot of role reversal, 
uh, at the Mummers Parade. There's uh, men, a lot of cross-dressing, uh, things like that. You can still find aspects of that in these parades. But everybody has a big time. <laughs> and here I happen to have a picture of some bell snickers. Uh, this is in Pendleton County. This is a picture from the West Virginia State Archive. Um, and uh, definitely there's no, I don't, can't have never found any theme with the bell snickers. Uh, it's just, I think the, basic idea is masquerade and when you're when you're behind a false space you know it really loosens up it really frees you up to do a lot of uh, things that you wouldn't maybe do if you uh, were exposed and people could identify you so I think that's part of the tradition as well um, I'm going to put up a picture here of another old older woman that I knew. This is Sylvia O'Brien. And this isn't uh, quite um, related to a mumming tradition in particular, but it's a midwinter tradition that it was pretty strong in West Virginia. I collected it from several people. And uh, Sylvia told me one time that, uh, and this may be something people have heard, that on Christmas Eve, and she said, Old Christmas Eve. On old Christmas Eve, um, all the animals in the barn would bow down and speak. And uh, that's a tradition that's been collected uh, throughout the Appalachians. It's actually a, been collected in Germany as well. Uh, but it's a pretty common old belief that on midnight of Christmas Eve, and as Sylvia said, it had to be old Christmas Eve. Um, that the animals would bow down and speak uh, right at the stroke of midnight. And I guess the, the, the uh, thought process behind it is that the natural world somehow uh, uh, identifies and, and depicts the birth of Jesus as being something spiritual that even the animal world recognizes. And so this happening takes place. Um, Sylvia talked a lot about the midnight suppers that went on at, at her place. And there was an old fiddler there named French Carpenter who would always play this old tune, uh, uh, Old Christmas Morning. So I happen to have my fiddle here. And I'll uh, get out of this for a minute. And, Play, uh, whoops. How do I get back here, Emmy? There's a picture of Jimmy Costa. <laughs> if you can see. Go to the top and press stop share. Stop share. Okay. So, um, Sylvia <laughs> talked about the old Christmas traditions and uh, talked about uh, this tune that was always played traditionally on old Christmas morning. Now, I don't know how many people know about old Christmas. Maybe I should talk about that for just a little bit. Um, the Julian calendar was what was recognized by the entire world uh, up until uh, I think it was in the 15th century when people in the Gregorian calendar came about, which was much more accurate than the Julian calendar. Now, with the uh, with the Gregorian calendar, a lot of uh, people, especially people in, in this country, uh, were, especially in the Appalachians, were predominantly Protestant people. Anything having to do with Pope Gregory wasn't cool. So there was a lot of resistance uh, to the, the adopting the Gregorian calendar. And it went on and on until 1752, when finally Britain and its colony in America uh, adopted the Gregorian calendar. When they did that, 
by that time, the Gregorian calendar and the Julian calendar were 11 days different. So a lot of people, old time people in Appalachia and in West Virginia, I even talked to people who remember celebrating old And it was done originally on January 5th, but it's still getting further apart from the Julian calendar, I think, and now it's all the way up where to celebrate Old Christmas it would be on January 7th. It's gotten that far different from the Julian thing. But there are a lot of old people who recognize Old Christmas as being the true date of Christmas. And there's lots of stories. And one of the stories is that a man, this was collected in some place in the Appalachians, I forget. A man was driving a team down the road on Christmas, on Old Christmas Eve. And at the stroke of midnight, his oxes stopped bowed down on their knees. And that proved to him that old Christmas was a true day. So uh, there was a, a story over in Britain for the Glastonbury thorn, which grows on Christmas every year. And so everybody watched to see when they changed to the new calendar, whether it would bloom on old Christmas or the new Christmas. And it bloomed on old Christmas and everybody decided that was that was it. Anyway, this old tune, and there's several tunes in West Virginia called Christmas Morning and Old Christmas Morning. And this one was the one played by French Parker. <laughs> ancient sound to me. And somehow, I, some, some parts of that tune sound like Swedish music to me. I don't know. Um, one thing I forgot to do, there is a tune uh, about Shanghai that I think is connected. I mean, the tune is called Shanghai. Uh, Beryl Hammonds, who lives in Pocahontas County, uh, Lewisburg Parade is in Greenbrier County, and the old form of Shanghai that took place in uh, Pendleton County, straddle Pocahontas County, and that's where Beryl Hammonds lives. So undoubtedly, there was Shanghai mumming going on there too. And Beryl played an old tune called Shanghai. And I would guess that uh, it's uh, it's uh, related to the mummy tradition of Shanghai. I don't know that for sure. But there's another tune called Shanghai that was played in northern West Virginia. A whole different tune. But anyway, here's Burl Hammond's version of Shanghai. <laughs> Thank you. 
again, it just sounds ancient to me. There's those, those tunes, they just have this ancient sound, as does the Mardi Gras song that you hear the Cajuns play. It just has such an ancient sound to it. They all sound really old to me. Um, I talked about the, the tradition of the animals speaking in old Christmas. Uh, but there's also a tradition that uh, I collected that uh, they call it shooting. And it took place here in West Virginia quite a bit. When I was a kid, me and my brothers would drive the backyard and shoot, shoot a gun and a shotgun in the air on New Year's Eve. And I don't know if that was related at all to this. It was a common thing to do when I was a kid. But in the real formalized version of this shooting tradition, uh, there was a long recitation and it took place, it started out on midnight of New Year's Eve and a band of shooters and a captain would go around from farm to farm and there's this long recitation. I collected two different versions of it, two different handwritten versions of this long recitation uh, that the captain would speak. And it was a blessing on the farm that it would, the animals would prosper and the crops would do well and on and on like that. And at certain intervals, all these guys would put their guns in the air and shoot. And then they would be in the house and they would be given uh, treats, cake, and brandy and stuff. And a lot of drinking went on and people thought it was an awful dangerous thing because all these guys by the end of the night were, were drunk and they all had guns in their hands. But uh, that was another tradition that's been documented in Germany, another old midwinter uh, tradition. And uh, so many of these traditions, especially the Roman traditions, have to do with, with the weather, as I think I said earlier. Um, that that the part of the year when when the when the everything dies in nature, which is when Halloween takes place and it's with the ghosts and the goblins and everything uh, uh, invoke death. Um, it comes from the Celtic Samhain, which is a Celtic word and it simply means the death of nature. That's what the word means. And so from the death of nature that takes place in the end of October and all the day of the dead and, and all the in the Latin countries, all have similar traditions. Uh, you get up to the winter solstice, which was the, the really main time when the Mormon traditions in ancient time were really important. Because that was the time, of course, when the sun stopped going lower in the sky and started its rise, which was an indication that uh, better weather was on the way. And so all the the people who studied these really ancient Mummy traditions believe that they were all uh, the, the deep psychological reason for these things were all about the weather. Of course, you know, back when we all live in heated houses with hot showers and, and running water and everything else, well, it wasn't always that way for the masses and masses of people. So there's nothing. Uh, I lived on a, on a real remote farm for 14 years, and I can tell you that you really pay attention to the weather when you don't have the grid feeding into your house. And, 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 and of course, that was probably nothing like people through the ages had, uh, had to deal with. So the weather was so important. And when you get up to the, the springtime traditions, mumming traditions, uh, like Fosnop, uh, which is, Fosnop means fast, night, which is the night before the Lenten fast began. Um, up in Pennsylvania, because this was a German tradition, and here in this county where I live in West Virginia, it's a Swiss German tradition, but uh, in Pennsylvania, uh, uh, they even called donuts fosnachs because they were all fried in deep fat. And that was the tradition you had to get rid of all the animal products in your home. So you fried all the, here at our uh, local celebration called Fosnock here in Helvetia, West Virginia, where Swiss German people settled. Um, they do the same thing. There's 
they emit ozone and blacks and colors and donuts and all fried in fat. So that the tradition was to get that out of your house. And because of the Lenten fast that took place. Now, uh, Lent, the word Lent comes from the word Lenten. Lenten as in Lenten. And originally, before it became a tradition, a trish, Christian tradition, it was a ritual fast to accelerate the lengthening of the day. And that was the original origins of, of the land. Uh, of course, now it's, 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 a, it's a Christian tradition among uh, those the Catholics. Um, but it's another mummering, mumming tradition. Here in West Virginia, people get in all kinds of outrageous costumes and masks. And uh, they march from here in this little town of Pelvisha, which is way up in the mountains and had an island from mountains. Uh, they march from the one, I was going to say an intersection, but it's not even an intersection, it's a T, the only one in town. They march from there where there's the Swiss restaurant, they march to the community hall, and they have a big square dance. And um, at the end of the night, they have old man Winter hanging in the middle of the dance hall, and they cut him down, take him outside, and burn him in a bonfire, which of course relates to this weather theme that runs to all of the mummy traditions. Um, so all the way through, there's a lot of um, things that seem to relate to each other in terms of things like uh, sanctioned begging, which happens with a lot of the things I've, I've uh, named, Bell's Nickling, and of course Halloween, and, and Shanghai, the old versions of Shanghai. Um, and a lot of it relates to uh, even the Saturnalian uh, traditions of the Lord of Misrule. In England, it was called the Mock King, and where everything gets reversed, everything gets turned upside down. And you see those traditions. I see it in the Shanghai Parade in Lewisburg, where a man walks down the street in a diaper, and, and things like that, where things just get turned upside down. So that's about the whole course of mummy traditions that, that I know about. Uh, Anybody has any questions? Then we have to try. Yeah, so anyone can put, if you're in the Zoom call, you can put um, questions in the Zoom chat and we'll ask them to visit Jerry. If you are on the Facebook um, uh, page watching, you can put um, questions in the Facebook comments and we will pass them on to Jerry. I have some questions while people are putting their questions in there. One is, you know, in, in like old English mumming traditions, there are a lot of songs that are related to them. Are there, is there music that's related to Bells Nickling or Shanghai or? Yeah, um, uh, there, there is, I've heard tangentially some things and, and the man that researched Shanghai in, over in the valley from long ago documented that there were a lot of singing traditions that went with it over there. Um, I don't know with the people that I talked about other than the tune I played, I haven't directly uh, found that, but um, it's, I would say it was probably part of it. Right. Um. One, one thing when we're talking about the, the sanctioned begging that went on with all these traditions, I know uh, some of you know Max Samples, who's a square dance caller who uh, comes to the best of my he, he learned from his, his old uncle. Uh, a little rhyme that I'm sure some of you heard that his uncle always said at Christmas time, and that was um, Christmas time is coming, the goose is getting fat. Please put a penny in the old man's hat. If you haven't got a penny, a hate penny will do. Hate penny. If you haven't got a hate penny, God bless you. So that was a traditional rhyme in West Virginia that had to this time when a lot of it had to do with uh, collecting money for the less fortunate. And that was another theme that runs through a lot of the money traditions. Right. Interesting. Jerry, even if there wasn't a particular song, do you have you heard of um, it seems like the kind of procession that would be led by a fiddler or have some sort of music or culminate in a musical event? 
have you heard any, has any research led you to any of that, even if it's not the specific repertoire? Yeah, I, I don't know. There was some music in the parade, the Shanghai parade, and just, you know, somebody might watch down with the bagpipe and uh, hanging on something like that. Of course, the, Shang, the Mummers parade in Philadelphia has become this marching string bands with, with tenor banjos um, by the dozen. Uh, is a big part of that. Sounds like something the accordion would be welcome at. Yeah. <laughs> well, certainly a uh, part of the of the party block, the tradition of which are just another form of money. Yeah, um, Lori DeBacco commented in the chat the um, that she sees many similarities between the pictures that you showed and the country Mardi Gras pictures that we see from the Miller family and friends down in the Lafayette units, all of that, that region. Right. Um, and if you can see pictures of what Robert Simmons talked about of all the old uh, of Shanghaiers on horseback in costume, it would probably look almost exactly like what goes on at, at the, Mar the rural Mardi Gras. Sort of right. Are there any Questions coming in on the Facebook, Seth? Um, I haven't pulled that one up. No questions, but a lot of colorful comments. There's a lot of folks that are really enjoying this um, this talk. And, uh, I get the feeling that there's a lot of traditions that we have maybe here or in the broader region that are drawn from this, like you said, without us even realizing it. It's just in the collective psyche the yearly cycle this is something we do every year we don't have to know why we do it <laughs> yeah right and that's pretty much a uh, 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 well-known folklore from henry glassy um documented the mummers play in uh, northern ireland which is a strong tradition there and the mummers play was actually documented in the appalachians and it's a situation where a man is slain this is all mock theater, but uh, they, the, the mummers would go from house to house and this man would get slain and then the doctor would come in and revive him. So people think that was the, the, the natural world dying and getting revived. And that's what some people have said the mummers play. So. Yeah. Yeah, interesting. Did anybody talk, has there been any, did you ever hear anybody talk about a play or a theater type thing, public theater as part of Bell Snickling or Shanghai? Uh, not other than that Monish play that I was talking about. Oh, well, so he was, he was talking about that in West Virginia or in Ireland? Uh, he was, uh, well, it happens in Britain and in Poland and Britain and Northern Ireland. Uh-huh. Yeah. He was researching it there. In there, yeah. Interesting. Well, there is a, a question over on Facebook about the uh, the names of the tunes that you had played. I, I believe there was two. Um, somebody was. I don't think that everybody caught the the names. Of them. So the the first tune I played was "Old Christmas Morning." Relates, I explained about the old date of old Christmas. And then the second one was simply called Shanghai, which is spelled S H A N G H A I. Shanghai. Great. Thank well, thank you so much, Jerry, for sharing this knowledge with us. It's really interesting. I loved seeing those pictures from the Lewisburg Shanghai Parade. And yeah. And sort of thinking about those connections, um, you know, I love thinking about the connection between a man in a diaper and a guy in a wheelchair with a his toy car strapped to him, like going back to like, um, you know, a mummer's play or a or a, you know the the bell snickling from house to house. It's really interesting to sort of see where uh, where these traditions can go. Mm -hmm. when when humans just carry them on it's wonderful yes and um 
before we forget, we would, uh, thank you, Lori, for reminding me, we would love if um, everyone who is here, if you would take a couple of minutes to fill out the survey, um, the West Virginia Humanities Council um, is a wonderful organization that, that sponsors, helps sponsor our humanities lecture series and also many, many other uh, wonderful programs around the state. Um, this day in West Virginia history, I always listen to on West Virginia Public Radio. Well, I, wrote, uh, I wrote a chapter about this stuff in my book. Oh, Sonic great. Stories and Witchery, which you probably won't find in fine bookstores near you. <laughs> you can find it on Amazon. <laughs> yes. Yes, and um, we're currently, the Augusta store um, is not currently up and running carry things like books and stuff, but eventually. I'll play a little, I'll play a little uh, happy tune here and you can fade me out or whatever you want to do. <laughs> yeah. 